studio. So because we just made a, a paint booth. All right, it says we're starting to record now. OK, I have I have Janae Nelson Nielsen, Emma Crump, Amy Fair. Is that right? Fairy, like tooth fairy. fairy. OK. Um, Hannah Lee. Ashley. Nicole, uh, those are the six that I have and three more joined. Who are the other three? Would you please tell me your names? Tatiana Manulinka. Tatiana. Oh, yeah, you, I was there when you came in and picked up your kit, right? Yes. OK, uh, and uh, who else? There's two others. I'm Natalie Davis. I, Natalie. I'm sorry, what was the last name again? Jarvis, J-A-R-V-I-S. Jarvis. All right, excellent. And then who's the 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 last person? I have Janae, Emma, Amy, Hannah Lee, Ashley, Nicole, Tatiana, and Natalie. And then there's one more person that joined and I can't see their name. Aubrey Sanderson. Aubrey, okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, th for those people that get perfect attendance and get to all the live meetings, uh, you don't get any extra credit points, but I will spend, send a special letter to your mother. Not really. Well, welcome to everybody. I'm glad you made it. All these meetings that we come to, I will record them and put them on our YouTube channel. Has everybody had a chance to subscribe to the YouTube channel? Yes. All right, everybody, um, there are links to it. If you can't find the links, let me know and I'll send you the link. But everybody needs to subscribe to that and uh, go through that and at least watch the lectures. Uh, there will be for each lecture, except for the first one on Monday, I will do three code words and you'll be responding. If you don't attend the live one, even if you have to go to work early, if you're at the live one and I have you down as attending, that's good. But uh, if you don't attend the live ones, you'll need to tell me what those three code words are and the date, and then you'll get credit for attending. Because I, since I spaced the code words out randomly throughout the the length of the uh, babbling, lecturing, then uh, I'm assuming if you got all three of the code words, then you watched most of it. Does everybody understand that? All right, good. The first code word for today is comprehension. And usually the code words are not intended to be ironic. Has everybody here been able to get their kit? Anybody have a tr problem getting their kit? I sent you an email about mine because I'm currently out of state. Oh, that, that's right. That's right. Uh, the building is open Monday through Friday. The building is open until uh, it's supposed to be open until 11, but it's actually open until the um, janitors decide to lock it up. So and but if you get there before nine o'clock at night, it should be open. And uh, the room 516 B is just left unlocked with the door wide open so you can go in anytime you're able and grab okay. it. <clears throat> And we had a new person just barely join. Who's that? The people I have are Janae, Emma, Amy, Hannah Lee, Ashley, Nicole, Tatiana, Natalie, and Aubrey. Who's the most recent person who joined? All righty. Now, um, it's important to, to let me know so that I can count you down as as uh, attending. Otherwise, you'll have to go through and watch the entire thing on our YouTube channel. The other things that are good about the YouTube channel is I also have the PowerPoint presentations that the other students have done and the applications of tools of the tools of artistic critique that other students have done. 99% of them are really good examples. There's a couple that maybe not 
are not so good, but they are all, uh, or most of them are really good examples to follow when you do your own thing. And you can put themselves on camera. You don't have to show your face at all. You can do everything entirely doing uh, screenshots of your computer screen or uh, aiming your camera phone at something and just recording your voice. About that. But we do that so that you can also see how the power and how to apply the tools of artistic critique. And I think next week I also want to watch a video with you guys. I I haven't been able to figure out how to get it to work consistently through teams. So it may be that people are just going to have to watch it on their own and we'll talk about it. But typically when we do these meetings, what we're going to be doing is I will, starting um, this weekend, send out emails telling you what we're going to be talking about. I'll need you to read uh, that section of the module or go be at least familiarize yourself with some of the artists we'll be talking about and then we can hold a conversation. Once a week we'll be going over at least one of the quizzes. Oh, Janae, you're back. Excellent. Uh, once a week we'll be going over at least one of the quizzes and we'll also talk about the projects. Uh, as you guys do the projects, whether or not what you're done with it, go ahead and submit it. And I usually will make comments. Well, I always make comments about the projects. If it's excellent, I'll tell you it's excellent. If there are some areas that need some work, I'll tell you that. But the sooner you turn it in, then whatever you might need to change to get more points, you have time to do that and make the changes. I may also send out uh, links to things like videos and stuff like that that I want you to watch before the meeting as well, because then the meeting will make, an, uh, when we get together on Teams, it'll make a lot more sense as we talk about stuff. And the second code word is going to be quizzical. And again, if you attended live and I'm marking you down as attending live, then you don't need to worry about these because you're here and you're getting counted for attendance. Now, right now, I only have nine people with their names down and there's 10 people here. Oh yeah, and you're here. Excellent. All right. So, and I, I believe that's all 10 people now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yep, that's all 10 people. Excellent. Now I wanted to ask you guys, to have, um, how many people have done that polyhedra exercise? I did it. All right, excellent. I know, I Janae. It. Excellent. I also, I also did it. All right, great, excellent. Hannah Lee, excellent, very good. You guys have gotten some really cool shapes. Now, Janae, I, I really like hers. Not I'm not dissing anybody, but I love the, the shape that Janae picked. Um, can you show us yours really quick? And see what show what it does. This is called a hexagram, a hexagon a kaleidocycle, because it will actually fold and uh, roll around like a tube almost. Yeah, it kind of does, but it it doesn't too. <laughs> oh well, there there it's gone. We get the point yeah. though. Yeah, there it went. <laughs> <laughs> Now, there, there is a point when you print that out on your printer and you start cutting it out and folding it and taping it together where your brain makes a shift. Who has, who experienced that and can tell us what that was like? What mental shift happened as you started putting this together? It was kind of, uh, when you're looking at it flat, it's hard to imagine what it's going to be. And you have to kind of like think of it three dimensionally, how you're going to like put it together and fold it to make it do that, I guess. <laughs> but but there is that, that shift. What do you normally do? As, you know, as a professional artist, what is your um, modus operandi? What's your main medium? Well, mine? Yeah. Um, 
I do a little bit of everything. I've done painting and I've done a lot of like uh, illustration and then I, I my major is actually photography. But I have done like ceramic stuff too, so I kind of have done a little bit of 3D, but not a ton. <laughs> Right, but, but you focus on uh, two dimensional artwork and that's what almost everybody does. Yeah, what um, it and with two dimensional stuff we deal with the. We try to get people to assume or imagine what we're trying to express by using our two dimensional tools. And with this, there is something specific that is happening to your brain as you cut this out and start folding it together. And some people have described it as a click. Some people felt like they were balanced. Some people felt like it was a window opening. And whatever that feeling is, experience that just for a moment. Because together might very well be painful. Not my intent. But as you learn new neuronic pathways and you start exploring that three dimensional world a little bit more thoroughly. Just like growing any new muscle, it may may hurt a little bit at the beginning, but uh, it's it's going to be fine. I promise. I haven't had anybody go through this class that was not able to fully recover in less than three years. <laughs> Some people looked really concerned. No, everybody will be fine. Trust me, it, you'll be fine. over the first quiz, quiz for module one, and we'll use that as a set of talking points to kind of roll into this class, okay? And then I wanted to ask a little bit about how people are doing on their projects, and I wanted to clarify a little bit uh, the research, the individual artist research papers you write for each module, and uh, a little bit about how some of those submissions work, all right? Now let's see if I can get I don't know if I mentioned last time, but I, I used to design uh, fonts for word processing computer programs. And I was all about computer aided design and everything in the 90s. And uh, yes, they had computers then. And uh, about 20 years ago, I came across a book written by uh, Theophilus. And it was the book is titled On Diverse Arts. You can find it on uh, Amazon for, I think, maybe 12 bucks, something like that. And that's when I started shifting to compass in a straight edge for almost all the work that I do. And now going back to technology, if I don't have an eight year old in the room, sometimes it's really hard to get things to work, but we will do our best. All right. When you say you did compass in a straight edge, were you doing um, like illuminations or what, what were you doing with comp a compass in a straight edge? Typically uh, for my artwork, I do a lot of, uh, I don't know if anybody's been to my websites, but I do a lot of geometrical sculptures. And the geometry I, I use, um, a compass and a straight edge and simple math to figure the geometry out. And um, let's see if I can, if I can pull something up really quick, I will. So you do like large installs, is that what you do? In, like the insula sculpture installations? Uh, most of my sculptures are about the size of uh, rugby balls. Oh, okay. Uh, but uh, for my large windows, everything that I do is, is pretty much by hand. I use the grid enlargement technique that was developed by the Egyptians about 5,000 years ago. And I figured if it worked this long, then it's probably still valid. Okay, I'm just going to do a quick screen share so you can see uh, one of the things that I do. If I can, maybe not. Okay, can everybody see this? Oh, yeah. Wow. So this is, um, it's glass that I've etched and drilled holes in. I've painted it. There's a dried pomegranate inside and the holes, I've tied it together using uh, medieval style, traditional book binding knots and uh, hemp thread. So I'm quite a bit, I'm quite a bit into geometry and all this is based on uh, compass and straight edge technology. 
Do you hand you hand cut that glass with a straight yes. edge knife? Wow. Yeah. This is really cool. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, do you sell at a gallery? I'm sorry, I haven't. I I need to catch up, but <laughs> I I've sold several pieces, but uh, the last couple of years I've been concentrating on other things, and I've gone back to to building a sculpture again. So I, I don't have a gallery. I'm not represented currently represented by a gallery. Beautiful. Thank you. Now I am going after stroking my ego there. Thank you very much. You get extra credit points. <laughs> They're about as valid as. <laughs> people voting on a school board, but still, if it makes you feel good. All right, let's see if we can find. I'm sorry, let's see. OK, I, what I'm going to do is just show you just a couple things really quick about different elements of the module. Of, the, of each of the modules, and then we are going to. Go over the quiz. So we look here. Can anybody see this? This is module one sculpture based photography. See, it has an introduction, it has some reading Not all of them will have readings. Some of them will. Sometimes that is just rolled into the introduction. We have the chapter quiz. And there'll usually be at least two chapters in the quiz. And the way that you take this quiz, I'll describe when we start going over the quiz. The research, the in the research section, uh, you will have, that's where the artists are for that module. And each of them will have at least one video associated with them. And I want you to watch all those videos and learn a little bit about each of those artists. Then the artist review, when you write this, it is about only the artists that are in that module. Like for example, let's see. If I hit this, can, can everybody see my screen now that it shows research one and then it has the, mo the videos underneath? Yes. Okay. This lists all the different artists that are in this module. So there's Andy Goldsworthy. Number two is Sandy Scogland. Number three, is James Casabir. Number four is Alejandra Leviata. Number five is Thomas Allen. Number six is Slinkachu. And number seven is Isaac Cordell. And number eight is Polly Becker. So these eight artists are the only artists you need to worry about for this module. And the information for the, the write up is from your impressions just watching the videos so you don't have to do any outside research rather than watching these videos okay and i'm going to go back so do, does everybody see I'm, my mouse is now on artist review number one okay i hit that the easiest way to do this write-up and almost all of these are going to be in one page they're all going to be rather short how many sentences are in a paragraph? Anybody remember? Is it like five, six? Three, three to five. I would not do fewer than three, and I would try really hard to avoid going longer than five. The easiest way to do these, to write these up, is just copy these three paragraph prompts. See this paragraph one, describe what you learned. Paragraph two, articulate which artists work. And paragraph three, list and give a brief explanation. Do you guys see those three? Yes. Okay, just copy those, put them at the top of your paper of your uh, Word document, and then respond to each of them one after another. So after paragraph one in italics, you'll write your three to five sentences about what you learned from looking at the group of artists. Then uh, um, you'll have paragraph two in italics, and then at, under that you'll write three to five sentences about which artists work you like the most and why. And then paragraph three, that's where you'll write three to five sentences about what you like the most about involving the viewer, which artists you like the most. OK, does this make sense to everybody? And when you do this, a paragraph three, it says very specifically, please identify at least four methods used. And that is from the textbook chapter one. And we'll go over that in that quiz 
that we'll do in just a minute. OK. Is this making sense to people or is anybody or does anybody have any questions? So every module will have a research uh, paper like this due. Right, and the research paper is specifically on what you learned watching the videos. OK, Great. OK, so who wants to do outside research beyond the videos? Is everybody, nobody's hands are going up. I am shocked. I mean, I'm dying to, but if you're going to make us not, then I guess I won't. Well, OK, if you really want to, I guess you can, but just there's like no really need to. Just like I don't really want extra chances to get more points on assignments, so. <laughs> so is this artist selection different than the one above? Because there was a whole list of a lot more artists. Right, and if you looked at that set of 75 artists, um, at the beginning of it, it said artists from module one. And those eight artists that are listed on that list of 75 are in module one's research. And that's true for all of them. The, the first uh, 45 artists, I think, are divided up into those six modules and the remaining artists of that, out of that 75 are ones that Jason and I just really like <laughs> that okay. deal with some stuff. And there are some fantastic artists. I think one of my favorites is Ai Weiwei. When you get to him, he is pretty, he is pretty incredible. Another set that I really love is Christo and Jean-Claude. I think that they are a total power couple in the arts. OK, now I'm going to do a screen share. And I'll get to the quiz. All right, here we go for the quiz. Can everybody see this? It says chapter one and two. Graded yes. quiz. OK, I'm going to hit preview. I'm going to turn off the time. There we go. Now the quiz, there are essentially three different kinds of questions that we put on the quiz. There are true and false or fill in the blank answer ones. There are short answer ones, and that way that one as soon as you turn in the quiz, the computer will grade you on those and you'll know right away whether they're right or wrong. The second type are short answer where you type in something and that's something that I have to grade. So you have to wait until I, I get I am able to grade it. And then the third one is short essay and the short essay before you freak out is usually two to three sentences at the most a couple paragraphs. And how long is a paragraph? Three to five sentences. Perfect. Excellent. Please don't write any more than that. Now uh, the way that you do these quizzes is don't worry about reading the chapters first. What I want you to do is know when the quiz says it's on chapters one and two, that's what it covers. So as you get to question one, scan through those two chapters really fast to see if you can find the answer. And just keep doing that, just scan through. If you want to, the best way to take this quiz with your book is to go through the chapters and look at all the, the uh, paragraph headings really quick, spend about three minutes doing that, and then that'll give you an idea of where to find the answers to the questions. And if all you do is use the book to answer the quiz, you're still going to be learning something. So that is just fine. All right. That is one of the reasons why we don't want you to spend $582.17 buying this off of Amazon Prime. OK. So as we go through, if you think you know the answer, go ahead and let me know. And since I'm lousy with names, if I tell you you're wrong, I'm never going to hold it against you because, Frank, honestly, I'm not going to remember. OK, question number one, true or false? Time, materials and tools are the three main factors that affect the cost of a work of art. Who would say that's true? I mean, I would say it's true, but I haven't read so. <laughs> No, but you're absolutely right. It is true. And when you figure out a price for something, what do you do? How do you figure out what the price is? How long it's going to take you and what things you need to buy to do it. And Exactly. I, I think that there's another factor that's pretty important, but I don't think it really talks about it in the textbook very much. And that fourth factor is... 
how much does a person want it? Is sometimes, and, and this is something that is really, really tricky to deal with, because sometimes when somebody wants to buy artwork from you, if you price it too low, they're not going to value it at all. And so that, that's something to consider as well. But yeah, time, materials, and tools are the three main factors. So that is absolutely true. Uh, for uh, Janae, you said you're a photographer. This, the photographs usually distort our perception of 3D work. Yes. It can. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the, the first thing is you're looking at a flat plane. Yeah. You know, you're, 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 and it, yeah, it does. Sometimes the distortion may be as simple as context. Where you can walk around a 3D object, but with a photograph, it's all presented for you. And it needs to be enjoyed in a slightly different way. So yeah, the answer to this is absolutely true. It does distort it, but distortion is not a bad thing. A lot of the times that can be a really good thing. Uh, for example, Andy Goldsworthy works in Scotland, but the reason we can enjoy his artwork all around the world is because of the photographs he takes. If he didn't do that, we wouldn't know who he was. Yeah, he's yeah, really he's <laughs> I think so. Okay, for true and false, sculptors generally do not need to consider the place where their work will be presented. Is that true or false? False. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think regardless of the work that we do, and regardless if it's spoken word poetry, music, uh, painting, or sculpture, how it's going to, it's going to be presented is a huge part of what of our considerations as an artist is there anybody that can make an argument against that because i would like to hear it i think of that james terrell guy that has that building in arizona where the light you know the sun and all of that affects affects the look of it just by the shadows it casts inside and outside well, and there's no way that building would be anywhere near the same thing if he if he did not have control over it, what, where it was. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. So the question, the answer to question number three: sculptors generally do not need to consider the place where their work will be presented, is definitely false. Question number four: there are some sculptors that rely on photographs for their work to be experienced. Is that true or false? True. True. This whole module is about that. So yeah, it's absolutely true. Who would know who Slinkichu was if it wasn't for photographs of his work? Or Sandy Scoglin, who would know what she, anything about a dream of radioactive cats except for the photographs of it? Okay, question number five. Height is the dimension unique to 3D work. Is that true or false? What are the two dimensions that are vital to 2D work? This is open to anyone can answer. Isn't the width of the 3D work the important part that makes it 3D? Uh, well, I was I was asking first, what are the two dimensions that are vital to two dimensional work? Whenever you send something away for um, a contest or an exhibition or something like that, what are the two dimensions they ask you to send them? Oh, um, height and length. Height and width. What? Yeah. Yeah. And so what's the third dimension? Depth. Absolutely. And third, uh, depth is the dimension that's unique to 3D work. So question number five is false. Uh, height is the dimension unique to 3D work. No, that, that is false. Depth is the dimension that's unique to 3D work. OK. Now, when you guys do these quiz quizzes, you can retake them as often as you want. If you do everything and you miss three points, and I point them out in the comments section. You can always go back and fix it. All right. 
there's no excuse for anybody not to get an absolutely perfect score on all their quizzes. Okay, question number six. Who knows what a maquette is? What's a maquette? Who of you do uh, game design? Or does any of, do any of you do uh, computer animation? Ma maquettes are usually scale models that artists use to kind of work through issues in a three-dimensional world, but without having to go through the expense and time of making the thing full size. These are really vital, especially when you're doing game development and uh, computer animation. You'll make a maquette first, and then that will help to govern how everything distorts appropriately uh, when when your character is moving. Uh, that would, I, I think if, if any of you guys see some of the um, behind the scenes footage for any of the the uh, Autobots movies, there's some really cool uh, maquette work that they're using. But is that the only way to plan three dimensional work? No, it's not the only way to plan 3D work. Right. What are, what other ways can you what other ways can you use to plan 3D work? Well, I'm sure there's different websites or tools that can be used and also pen and paper. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of the oldest Greek temples, and I can't remember which island it's on, but about 35 years ago, people finally solved the riddle of all these scribed lines that were on the floor. Uh, these lines were drawn and etched into the floor by the builders of this Greek temple, and they found out that it was the geometric construction lines that the architect was using in order to plan out how to put up the walls. So yeah, they, they used sketches way back then to build 3D stuff. So uh, question number six, maquettes are the only way to plan 3D work. The answer to question number six is false, because there are several other ways, and you're absolutely right. Excellent. Now if we go to question seven. One reason why an artist should consider their audience. I only need one, re one reason for this, but there are at least five. Let's have people say different answers. So somebody who hasn't spoken already, give me. So was the question, um, why, why do we need to uh, engage our, or, um, yeah, what, what is one reason why an artist should consider the audience? Um, I think we want to make sure that we keep them interested or they're just going to ignore it or pass it by. That is excellent. So engaging interest. Very good. What's another reason? Um, I want to add, um, like engaging interest, but also like they want to control like how it'll be received. So you can't completely control it, but you, um, I'm so sorry. I had it and then I unmuted my myself and now I don't have <laughs> it. So yeah, I'll answer I a different question. Yeah, but, but, uh, one is engaging audience. Another one is you basically want to know the context that you're in, right? So that you can you can uh, not really control, but be aware of how it's going to be received, right? Yeah, excellent. Very good. What's another reason? I would venture to say financial. Oh, very um, good. If you if you get to the point where you're selling your art so there's like a illustrator or a photographer or the many other types of artists that are out there if you don't have an audience 
that is interested in your work in that retrospect, then you're really going to suffer for it. You're absolutely right. Can you imagine manga style uh, superhero portraits? Somebody trying to sell that to my grandpa who thought it ain't art unless you can see it out the window and it ain't music unless you can whistle to it. So yeah, that's, that is very true. So just, just from a, 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 pr a practical standpoint, you've got to know. Uh, what else? Can anybody think of another one? Would you have to consider like religious beliefs as one of them? I would think so. Yeah. I think. Um, I mean, what's that? I was just going to say, along with religious beliefs, I mean, there's social issues that are going on right now that a lot of people, you know, focus on um, to sell art. Yeah, and I, I think both of those are really, really good. Very good. You need to know your audience for a number of reasons. But if you were doing artwork about um, over proliferation of guns and you were showing it at an NRA convention, you're going to get a much different reception than what you probably hoped for. If you're going to be going, uh, if you're going to be doing stuff that where you're kind of making fun or poking fun at monolithically ad adopted uh, religion that takes itself too seriously, you need to be very aware of what your audience is. You show that at a conservative Sunday school, it, you're going to be getting a much different reception. So I, yeah, I think these are all really good reasons, and I only need one on the quiz. So you know, come up, just select one and uh, write that down. And a lot of the times, I value articulation and being able to explain yourself. So even if I don't agree with you, if you make a good argument for it, you'll still get the points. Excellent. Moving on. OK, this is a good one. What is the difference between fine arts and applied arts? What are fine arts? What are applied arts? The thing that's so funny about this is that this did not even become a consideration until pretty much uh, the Industrial Revolution. Before then, artists, for the most part, produced art. And art was pretty much anything that didn't happen to exist before. So if you made a new spoon, you were a spoon artist. If you made a new stained glass window, you were a glass artist. If you if you dress stone, you were a mason and you were an artist. And if you're a farmer, same thing. You were an agricultural artist. In the Industrial Revolution, that brought about a whole lot of suddenly middle income people. You didn't have a super hierarchy of rich and a super lower archy, if that's a word, of poor. You had a whole bunch of people in, in between that had disposable income. And we can see on a smaller scale as um, uh, in the Muslim world, same kind of thing happened. What happened here uh, in the Western world with the Industrial Revolution, people found that the middle income folks wanted essentially prestige items. They wanted stuff to show off. And that's when art pieces, for the sake of looking at them, kind of developed and became its own thing. It was always there, but that's when it started developing its own identity. And that's when you, uh, that's what paved the way towards uh, salon exhibitions, for example, in, in uh, Paris that became so famous in the 19th and early 20th century. People had disposable income, they wanted original art. And that the fine arts became things that were separate that existed just to enjoy. If that's true, what do you think applied arts are? So is it like taking um, 
useful items, practical items like a dish or something and making it beautiful or? Well, actually, actually applied arts apply to anything that's functional. And I'm not talking about uh, painting saw blades. That's that you're pushing it into a fine art category. But if you're a craftsperson and you make really good saw blades, then your saw blade making is an applied art because that people use it as a tool or they use it for other things. So the difference between this is fine arts exist to be enjoyed or appreciated and applied arts are made to be used. All right. Of course, I gave you more of an explanation than you need for the quiz. But uh, I don't want it ever to be said. That I give up the opportunity to use a three dollar word when a 25 cent word will do. OK, what are the two extremes of material choice in sculptural works discussed in the text? This is a tricky one. This is one of the questions we throw in to make sure whether or not people have read the textbook. Because there is one answer to this. If you don't read the textbook, if you read the textbook, it gives a completely different answer. Anybody want to guess what that answer is? Shall I tell you so that you're amazed at my wisdom and insight? Please. Thank you. When we are working on stuff, we have almost limitless materials to work to use when we do sculpture. What this is talking about are not specific materials. We're not talking about stone or wood. What we're talking about are the extremes of material choice. You can choose to use materials and emphasize their native or natural qualities, or you can choose to use materials and make them look like there's something else. Uh, for exa a good example of this is I know a person who makes really high end custom artistic furniture. And he will find these beautiful chunks of wood. He will carve them, sand them down, polish them and stain them or oil them until the wood grain just absolutely glows and it is astounding. You're lost just in the beauty of the wood. That extreme is emphasizing the native or natural qualities of the material. Another artist I know is a ceramicist. And one of the things he enjoys doing is making genre or everyday objects that are on a one to one scale of their actual real world counterparts, but he does it out of porcelain or ceramic. Uh, he made a pair of flip flops that everybody that saw them could not understand why they were in the exhibit because they looked exactly like ordinary flip flops until one of the curators went to uh, pick one up and he realized it was actually stoneware that uh, my friend had very carefully prepared textured and glazed so that they looked exactly like those really cheap dollar store flip flops. So that is a great example of the other extreme making something look. Uh, making the material look like something it's not. Now and, and pretty much everything we do will fall into those two extreme or will lean maybe one uh, towards one of those two extremes. But can anybody give me any other examples of either of those two extremes? What's a good example of the one extreme where you're using the natural beauty of the object or the material? I can think of the columns in buildings where they faux paint the columns to look like marble, but it's really just paint over cement or I don't know what medium they would use. Uh, yeah, usually it's a translucent plaster mixture. But yeah, absolutely. That is a perfect example of the set, the other extreme where you're making material look like it isn't or something it isn't. Ulm, Germany, the the monks there at the um, monastery would make money doing faux uh, marble painting. And when King Mad King Ludwig uh, in Germany made his hair in Kimse, which is supposed to be the German Versailles, 
he had them paint, I think it was 117 different kinds, distinctly different kinds of polished stone appearing surfaces. And it's all translucent plaster. So there, there's granite, there's all these different kinds of fantasy marble and stuff. It's just absolutely astounding. But yeah, absolutely. That is a very good example of that. Ulm, Germany in World War II had the highest uh, tower in their cathedral of all of Europe. And when the Nazis challenged the Allies, uh, told them they couldn't hit it because it was the largest structure and were teasing them, the Allies, even though it, uh, they knew it was beautiful, and so they bombed it with sacks of flour. So when the Germans woke up the next morning, Ulm Cathedral was all white with flour because the Allies did not want to destroy such a beautiful building. Oh, that was kind of a cool story. All right, who recognizes this? What monument is this from? The Lincoln Memorial. The Lincoln Memorial. In Washington, D.C. <laughs> exactly. Which lighting did they end up using? The one on the left or the one on the right? The one on the right. <laughs> I mean, left. <laughs> sorry, left. <laughs> yeah, the one on the left. Um, this, when uh, French put this together, they were not going to give him money to do the lighting. They were going to do it themselves. So he, he actually set up a maquette of Lincoln's head in the exact same position that he, it is in the monument. And he lit it six different ways. And then he gave the photographs to the, the funding committee and said, this is why I want to control the lighting. The one on the right, can you imagine the reaction if that was how it was lit? It looks I mean, scary it looks, in that one. It, it looks like somebody just caught him right after he farted. I mean, it is so disrespectful. So, you know, this, this is the importance of, or it, I think it really talks to the importance of having some measure of control over how our art is displayed. How many of you have participated in a gallery show and your work was put right next to the bathroom in that little back hallway? Anybody have that experience? I was it, by the bathroom at Swiss Days one year. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. Was that bad? <laughs> yeah, no one cares. They're just on their way to the bathroom. They don't care about your stuff. No, but it makes it really hard to sell. And it really, but it, more than that, it really makes it hard for your audience to appreciate it in any manner approaching how you intended it. Um, now, today, uh, Tuesday, Thursdays, I'm usually going to go only about an hour or so. I think I'm going to go a couple minutes over that, if that's okay with anybody. I know you all have uh, really exciting lives to live outside of school, but uh, I may go over a little bit. But yeah, controlling lighting, things like that, they are important as an artist, I think. Okay, question 11. Does anybody know the four degrees of dim three dimensionality? This is very much in the in the textbook. And ag again, you're probably going to be looking for the heading of um, dimensionality or degrees of relief, something like that. These four degrees begin with something that is almost flat, go all the way through to the extreme of three dimensional work. A relief is like a coin. Everybody has the coins or does anybody have coins, I guess, because there was a coin shortage due to COVID. Does anybody know what a coin is anymore? Uh, coins are made by stamping uh, hardened metal dies uh, into plate metal. And so you need to be able to pull the molding medium right off of the, the metal that you're keeping. So you're going to have straight or very shallow or shallow angled sides. And the whole image is not going to poke out very far. You're not going to have any undercuts. The point to the relief, though, is that some of it is coming towards you. So it's the very first stage of three dimensionality. The second is frontal. This is where the artist controls the viewer's approach to the work. Whether or not the work is made as a full sculpture or not, the artist has put it either against the wall, in a corner, or in a niche, 
So you as a viewer can only approach it from a very controlled point of view. All right, so you can appreciate the three dimensionality, but only from one perspective. What do you think fully round means? Like I think it means you can kind of walk around the full object and see it from all sides. Absolutely. I'm sorry, I was nodding my head you could, and I forgot you couldn't see it. <laughs> but yeah, you're absolutely right. You, the artist has taken the time to make the, the piece fully dimensional and uh, prepared it or presented it in such a way that you as the viewer can walk around the entire thing. So yes, you're absolutely right. Can anybody give me an example of then the next step, the walkthrough work? I mean, is it just what it sounds like? You walk through it and experience it as you're walking through it? Like a. Like, give me an example. I mean, like I'm just specifically thinking of that James Terrell place that you walk through and you experience the the shadows, the light, the, you know, I don't yes. know. I'm guessing. Yes, absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Um, a little bit more mundane is that any buildings are walkthrough works. They aren't all designed beautifully, that's for sure, but they are designed as walkthrough works. Uh, does anybody know who Vitruvius is? I'm sure you guys have all are all very aware of Leonardo da Vinci's sketch, The Vitruvian Man. Vitruvius was a Roman architect who wrote a series of books oh, talking yeah. about how architecture, since it needs to be lived in, needs to follow the relative proportions of the human form. And his points of view on how beautiful buildings are designed and made he wrote that almost 2000 years ago and it's still valid today. So if you get a chance, look up Vitruvius. You can find his books pretty cheap on Amazon. If you go to the uh, website sacred-texts.org, all of his work for free. Very cool stuff. But yeah, those are the four stages. Uh, relief where it's flat with just some poking out like a coin. Frontal where it's three dimensional, but you can only view it from one perspective, fully round, where like a, a, the one student said, you walk all the way around it, and the walkthrough, where it's like a building or like James Terrell stuff. So yes, very good. Going to the next question. In this, in the textbook, I can't, I, I believe this starts on page 27, I'm not entirely sure. But the chapter, the overall chapter heading refers to ways of involving the viewer. And there are eight chapter headings for the nine different ways. And this, what I want you to do is pick five of those nine ways. And to get all 10 points, what you'll do is list one of them, briefly describe what that is. Then list the second one, briefly describe what that is. It starts on page 17, just so everyone knows. <laughs> Seven, 17, okay. So, uh, but that that's that's all, basically all that you have to do for this. You'll find that in each of the quizzes, there's always one or two questions. Just to the text. The rest of them, artist. You pretty have you have a pretty good understanding of all this stuff anyway, but there's answers that are designed or there's questions that are designed specifically to address your knowledge from the text. I'll give you one example. From the uh, what's the simplest definition of a line? Anybody want to want to get that handle that? I will answer it so that I don't embarrass anybody. From a mathematical perspective, everything that we were taught, the simplest definition of a line is the shortest distance between two points. To get the answer correctly on the quiz, you'll need to quote what the, the textbook actually says 
regarding the simplest definition of a line, and it is not the same thing. All right? But that's each of the quizzes has one or two questions like this. Question 12 here on this quiz is the second one. And the first one was uh, right at the beginning. Let's see. Yeah, the, the, the two that are that there's another one in the textbook. And it is talking about the extremes of material choice. So that so um, those are the two ringers in this one. But does everybody kind of get the idea of what we do with the quizzes? Was it helpful to go through this? Yeah, so they are. So that's what I was wondering is if they are open book, you're saying they are open book. We can just kind of go yeah. through. OK, absolutely. Yeah, go ahead and go through. Use the textbook. That's what it's that's what they're there for. All righty. Now. Um, we talked about. We talked about uh, the artist research, what you do for each one. Does everybody understand that those artists listed? Have to do specific. Oh, let's see. I have a, there's another person that came in. I guess we have 11 people here today. Um, who came in after Yen Chen? I, I called everybody's name. Whose name did I not uh, get? Because I can't see. I can't see the list of people that got here. See, so we've got uh, Aubrey, Natalie, Tatiana. Nicole, Ashley, Hanalee, Amy, Emma, and Janae. Whose name did I not call? I think you didn't call me. Oh, okay. Is it Xiaosheng? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Okay, the third. Uh, the third code word for today is going to be present. And again, if you did not attend today, I have 11 people attending. If you did not attend today, when you watch this video, you'll need to record or uh, send me all three of those um, code words. Does anybody have any questions about the research section of each module and what's expected in writing that uh, artist review? I'm a little bit confused because there's the one that has the whole list of all of them and I thought you had to do it on, like one on just like a big report on that one. Somebody on that list, I guess. Yes, that's right. Okay, that's so right. you're still doing that along with the ones in each module. Yes, the difference is the artist research and selection. You will focus on one artist that is not like you. I ask you to uh, self identify. 10 traits that are just very personal. I don't think I ever want you to share those with with me. At all, but um, what you'll be doing is going through that list of 75 artists as quick as you can. I think the record is 54 minutes, and that is held currently by the 12 year old son of one of the art students from fall of 2020. Uh, most people take about two and a half to three hours to go through all that. But find one artist that you resonate, whose work you resonate with, who is not like you somehow. And that's the person that you will do that larger report on. For each of the module, each of the modules will require you to go through the list of artists in the section that is just labeled research, and then it has the module number. And then the artist review, that is a one page paper, and it usually has either three paragraphs, or if it has more than three paragraphs, they're all going to be like two sentence paragraphs, so they don't really count. 
but uh, it's going to be a one page paper that is basically following each of those paragraph prompts that, that I showed you uh, just a little while ago. And so that's what the difference is. Each module has its own little artist review. And then you also do for module seven sections A, B, C and D. You're going to be doing a little bit more focused review and research on one artist. And I would recommend. Go to our YouTube channel. And look at PowerPoint presentations and just go through some of those um, playlists. OK, I, I think there may be two play playlists, one for spring semester this year and one for uh, summer first block this year. And that will give you an idea of what to kind of expect. All right. You probably Did say this where, but where um, at what point do we need to choose that artist? Is it is it fairly soon so that we can start working on their paper? Is that what? Well, each of the OK, well, um, let me do a screen share really quick. Okay. All right. On this, can everybody see my my screen here? Yes. OK, it says module 7.A. This is the artist research and selection. So the, so the first thing it kind of describes what it is, that's the artist research area. Then you have the artist list. That's when you copy the artist list and you go through and you find one sample of each artist's work on that list. And then the third thing is the artist selection. That's where you will pick one of those 75 artists to work on. And that's all you're going to do for this module. You're going to pick that. You're going to need, uh, you're going to describe briefly some of the traits that are specific to that artist and why uh, very briefly why that artist's work resonate with you and then you're going to submit the work log and the work log the main reason we do the work logs for each of the modules is because it's uh, been mandated by the department basically what you're saying is this week on this module i spent two hours and, and uh, 47 minutes looking up all 75 of these artists writing the artist selection thing and posting it and um doing this work log. And then you'll submit that and that's it. If we go down a little bit. You'll see here 7 B. That one you're not going to worry about for another couple of weeks. That is when we're going to deal with an annotated bibliography. And we'll talk about more about that next week. And then you'll write a do a work log that is just keeping track of your time for the annotated bibliography. Then if we scroll down a bit, you have 7C. Here's the PowerPoint presentation. You'll do that and this is not good to do until the um, August 1. And you'll do uh, you'll read about how to do that. You'll you'll submit your PowerPoint in a file to me. I'll post it on the YouTube channel and then you'll do a work log just for that. And then the very last one that's due on August 8th. That's when you just write a five paragraph paper reflecting on your artist, why you chose them and what resonate. What about their work resonates to you? So I space this out so you don't have to do everything all at once. I don't want you to do everything all at once because you will burn yourself out. But that's why we have several different different of these. All right. Does that make a little bit more sense? Yes. Thank okay. you. Now, uh, the other, but you brought me to something else that I really need to talk about. The work log for each thing is only for the module that that work log is labeled to. Like this work log is only for the work related to research module 7A. So when you are doing, writing your artist selection, when you are thinking about personal traits, a list of 75 artists, keep track of that time because it's its own thing. And then you'll submit that time in the work log. When you do your sculpture based photography, everything for this, reading the introduction, doing the extra reading, uh, going through and taking that quiz, watching all those videos, writing your artist review, building your house, taking pictures of it, and working on the discussion board, 
all of that is its own thing and all of that needs to be in its own work log. So all the work for module one, you record in the work log for module one. And this is a good example of that. Where. This person hasn't included any of their work for uh, the the big artist research paper. They've only included all their work on module one. They've listed the time for each of the different activities like uh, going through taking the quiz open book. That's how much it uh, took an hour and a half. Watching all the videos and then writing the artist review took them almost three hours. You see all that they're listing out each of those thing activities and then at the end they put a total. I really appreciate it when people follow this model because otherwise I have to add up all the numbers and when I'm on a roll grading it is so nice. I am always in a better mood giving more points when people follow this model and make it easy on me. All right, does this make sense to everybody? Yep. All right, good. Now um, that also leads me to something else that's really important. How long should each of these um, modules to be taking about? It, it is in the, the introductory material. But um, I it should be about 10 hours. For like the sculpture base. 10 hours, that's how we try to break it up. So if you find. All the way done with the whole thing and two and a half hours on it. Two of those hours have been used up doing all your reading and research for the artist and writing the paper. So if you've only spent like 30 minutes actually doing the sculpture. That's going to be very difficult. To produce a sculpture that takes all the points. And that's well built. I'm not looking for masterpieces, but I am. But all of you are professional. Artists. Good craft, and that's what I'm looking for. So like like a house that's sound and well built enough that you can carry it wherever you go to take pictures of it in all sorts of fun settings. I wanted to show you. OK, it's not here. I wanted to show you something really cool and let's see if I can get to. The page. Can everybody see this new page? This this is a paper home and it's this artist has done all these little basically what we're doing uh, paper paper homes paper houses and I don't expect anybody to go to this length because this took so, took a lot more than 10 hours to make these but what I would do would you like you to focus on is this person has used a lot of creativity making several different shapes of homes And some of them would be very interesting to photograph. And I want you to think about that as you design your little house to build and to photograph. Like this one right here has all these windows that are cut out. I mean, this orange with the purple roof. It has all these little windows cut out. How cool is that going to be if you have different lighting effects through all the windows? How cool would this be if the bottom was just cut out so you could see all the way through? And the top, you had tissue paper behind those windows, and you put like a, just a little one of those tea lights in it, a battery powered tea light, so that it glows when you put it in a shadow or something. Wouldn't that be kind of cool? So I, I want you to just spend like 10 minutes looking at all of these little paper homes and generate some fun ideas. Like here, this green one has a really cool roof line. This green one. Looks like it uh, reminds me for some reason of an apple. And it has that straw. It looks like a giant straw in it. Uh, this one over here, the, the kind of dark teal one. That's a really fascinating shape for a building. You know, the, this uh, light blue one up here, it has kind of a traditional building or home shape. But what's interesting about it is that it has like a 
a clear story section between the roof and the block, the cube of the structure, and it has recessed arches, which would be kind of fun to do. Or that orange one on the right hand side here that has all these arched windows going around it. Do you guys see what I'm saying? All right, good. I want you, all of you are professional artists, I want you to have fun designing a really cool house that you think would be super fun to photograph. And I will, I promised last week, I would give you a really bad example of a student that did this before. What they did is they made a really simple house. They put it in a diorama. And then they took five photographs walking around this diorama, just at, at five different points staring at the house. The whole point to this exercise is putting it in different settings with different lighting conditions. And you just experiment with that. And after you do that, save the five best ones. And those are the five you're going to be submitting and putting in on the discussion board. All right. And for that discussion board, what I need you to do is go to that module about the tools of artistic critique. And I would like everybody this week to try to do that first of the three steps. And that first step basically means you find the announcement or you find the page that delineates the four tools of artistic critique. And you just write down one question from each of those four uh, steps that resonates with you. And over the weekend, I'll send you guys a link to a video that I want you to watch. But I, I would really like you to find that and just be and be aware of it. That's basically the point to that exercise. Find out where it is, be aware of it, and we will talk about it more on our Monday meeting. All right. Does anybody have any more questions for me? Anybody not get their kits yet? Other than the one who's out of state? Everybody got it? Who's having a hard time getting their, their uh, textbook? Anybody? Is everybody getting it OK? I did have one student last year buy it on one of these community forum type things. And the person um, evidently ended up stiffing them. They claim that they sent it without a tracking label and it got lost in the mail. Uh, she luckily she was able to get her money back, but that kind of stuff really irritates me when it's one of my students that are getting scammed. If it was somebody else, I wouldn't care. But uh, there are different places you can look for. You can rent it on Amazon. There's also I also sent out an email link uh, to another textbook rental place, uh, the Facebook Marketplace. There are a couple of people selling theirs, and I am a couple of people have expressed interest. I have two students from previous semesters that are wanting to sell their books. I have already uh, first serve kind of thing on that. So the people that emailed me first, I put in contact with them. If um, those fall through, I'll send them your, you know, whoever was next, I'll send the contact info so you can talk to them. And uh, hopefully everybody by the end of this week, before you guys get screaming drunk watching fireworks on Sunday night, to get your textbook. I'm afraid if you wait until Sunday night, after two six packs of beer watching fireworks, you're going to be one of the people that bought it for $582 on Amazon Prime. I don't want you to do that. <laughs> okay. All right, we are we are done for the information that I needed to cover today. The uh, what questions do you guys have that I can help answer? Or you that you hope I can help answer? Um, I just had a quick question about the sculpture based photography on the house. Okay. Um, are we only able to use like the, the cardboard um, tape and just, you know, cutting it and stuff? Or can we paint it? Can we, if we have a little extra time, can we do you know, more some with of the, it? I, that's, that's an excellent question. That's a really good question. Some Thank of the you. ones. People have done different things with paint. People have uh, glued different textures mm -hmm. on it. Uh, one person did a corrugated, they wanted a corrugated tin roof look 
and they made that out of, out of aluminum foil. It worked out really well. Uh, somebody else That's cool. uh, wanted a, a shingle look, and so they actually carved. I, that seems to be a lot of energy, but they carved shingles. They actually like split <laughs> the uh, the mulch bark and used that for shingles on the house. Oh, um, wow. uh, people painted with the the textured acrylic. You know, the, you know what I mean. The the, the acrylic. Okay, that, so you can. Yeah. So you can do all sorts of different things. Yeah, please. Okay. Knock yourself out. Good to know. I, I would spend several hours making Thank it. Thank you. So it looks cool, and it would be super fun to photograph. Awesome. Janine, since you're a awesome. professional photographer, you know, no extra pressure on you, but we're expecting remarkable things. <laughs> do we? Do they? Do you have a gallery afterwards where you we share them, or do we critique each other's, or is this just simply submitted and and? No, that, that's an excellent question. Because... I'm going to do screen share again. Uh, give me just a second here. Okay. Can you see this? Yes. I'm, I'm, you're still, I'm still, all right. We go all the way down here. I go to the next one. This is in the module as well. This is discussion one, sculpture-based photography. What you'll need to do is go to this. You'll upload five images. I would keep them under uh, 500K in size so that it, it can operate and load well. But you're going to do, you're going to upload your five images and then you're going to come back and give feedback on the images of three other students. All right. And this is going to be graded. So Part of it is uploading your own images because you'll also be submitting the five images to me separately. But everybody will participate in this discussion. You'll upload your five images. Then you're going to refer to that Tools of Artistic Critique paper. And it's either on the pages or announcements. And you're going to select something of those questions. And you're going to post a comment that is so that you're mindful of what the tools of artistic critique are. What I mean by this, and I'll give you an example. Somebody posts five images of their cardboard mushroom house in different settings. And what you would uh, post in response is, Kaylee, this is fantastic. I have never seen something like this where it's a, a plausible looking mushroom that could function as an actual home. And your photography really puts it in interesting places. And it, it made me really think about this. That's an example. Another one would be, um, man, John, I, I saw your images. And even though the five images are completely different settings, one thing that really struck me is the depth of texture you put on your, your home structure. And I just, that, it produced some very interesting does everybody understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. So if we look at that module one, you'll see that the sculpture based photography, this is where you submit the five photos to me separately. And then the next one is the discussion. That's where you will post those five photos onto the discussion board. And then you'll come back and discuss by commenting on the work of three other students. And these comments cannot be oh so pretty. They need to be at least a sentence long. Okay, and I would I would shoot for two or three sentences. Critique does not mean critical. All right? It just means you're making an observation and you love their work. Does, that, does everybody understand that? Yes. So you're saying we post it on the discussion, but did, did I also hear you say that we, we send it to you individually as well? Right. And again, I'll show you those two things. In this module one, this 20 point assignment that says sculpture based photography, that's Sorry. the one that you'll open up and send me the five images. And then the 10 point one, that's where you'll submit the, the five images on the discussion board and comment on three other students. OK, thank you. All right, does that help? Frustrating sometimes is 
like classes that you're you're probably familiar with to clarify this and a couple of you have pointed out mistakes i made in the syllabus where i was still talking about a uh, hybrid class or live person attendance when you come across those please email me immediately and let me know so i can go back and correct it okay i, I really appreciate it when people do that now i will tell you a secret the main reason why you post these comments on other people's uh, images using those elements of the tools of artistic critique is that you can demonstrate you have a superior vocabulary to all of your non-art contemporaries. That is the principal purpose. When you're at a family party and they say, what do you do? And you say, I'm an artist. They roll their eyes and say, what do you do for money? You can start talking using these high value high intensity vocabulary words and just blow them away with your intellect. That is the whole point to this class. I'm being somewhat flippant, but I think it is valuable to own your artistic nature and to be, be able to articulate in such a way that you flabbergast the people around you and they simply cannot put up an argument. All right, that's that's what I want to see from all of you by the end of this term. <laughs> All right, any last questions? That was a good one, Amy. Thank you so much. Any Thank last you. ones? All right, so I gave the three code words for the people that are not attending live and you are uh, seeing this online. Pay attention to those code words. I will email the entire class as soon as this is up on our YouTube channel. All right? If there's no other questions, I will look forward to seeing you guys Monday. Look for my email over the weekend. All right, and that will tell you what things to watch for and be prepared for when we get into our meeting. Okay, thank you guys. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right, we'll see you all later. <laughs>